Well, good morning. It is end of the second quarter of 2023. It's amazing to think that half the year has already gone by. Good morning. I'm Kenny Polkar, your host of the party. And today is June 30th, 2023. And it is Friday before the long holiday weekend. So here's what you need to know, right? Because there's a lot happening today. Investors are either not listening or they're not paying attention to what JJ says, right? The U.S. macro data remains stronger than anticipated. The markets are now pricing in a 50% chance of two more rate hikes, July and September. Remember August, there's no meeting. The dollar surges, naturally. Gold uh, comes under some pressure, naturally. Yet oil makes a small advance for other reasons. Apple becomes a three trillion dollar company in the pre-market trading this morning and that is igniting more excitement in the tech space and what do we have for dinner well once again it's the weekend coming a long holiday weekend we're gonna have the tuscan pasta salad that you can serve at your barbecue okay look there's gonna be no note on monday i'm going on vacation i'm gonna be up in cape cod there'll be no note on monday so the next note will be wednesday so everybody, happy 4th of July, take good care, be careful, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Okay, so, so uh, uh, stock investors continue to digest this war on inflation and the fact that JJ has been very clear. He said it on June 14th, he said it again on the 28th, and on the 29th, right? Uh, and there have been all the members of the Fed with their own opinions that have also kind of weighed in. Now, rates are going higher and higher still. The idea that we were at the top is now out the window. And if you weren't on board yet, you have to be on board now because yesterday's economic data, the jobless claims and the GDP demonstrated that the U.S. economy is alive and well. The recession we've all been expecting remains at bay. Many analysts now say it won't arrive until 2024. Investors continue to process the strength of this data and whether or not the Fed can navigate that soft landing. Uh, and they're coming up with both positive and negative implications. The positive part is the strong economic data, right? Strong labor market, unemployment, near store flows, building consumer confidence, a strong housing, even in the face of rising mortgage rates. And you would think that's good, right? Well, it is and it isn't. And it isn't right now because we have another problem, sticky inflation caused by uh, the Fed mostly, but also caused by all the spending that the Bidens are doing down in D.C. Uh, and that they've instituted since his inauguration. And as you know, one of the Fed mandates is to control price instability, otherwise known as inflation. And the stronger the economy continues to be, the more the Fed will get pushed into the corner because the core rate of inflation remains elevated. J.J. all but said that on Thursday while he was in Madrid and before that in Portugal. He, they, the Fed, remain concerned about the stickiness and he doesn't expect inflation to hit his 2% target now until sometime in 2025. And that's going to cause him and the other central bankers, state, the European Central Bank, Bank of England, Bank of Japan, Reserve Bank of Australia, Bank of Canada, Swiss National Bank, Norges Bank, to remain vigilant, which means hawkish which means higher rates, Kavish. Now, you would think that the markets should be a bit more concerned about this, no? Well, yes, they should be, and investors should be concerned as well. But they keep taking stocks higher and higher as if none of this matters, which is where the disconnect is. But remember, we're also at the end of the quarter, so there's lots of rebalancing. Rebalancing that I thought was going to see some pressure on these outperformers, think in the tech space. But amazingly, that hasn't really happened. I mean, it's kind of happened, but not to the extent I expected. It appears that asset managers are going to go out with a bang this quarter. And you know what? Good for them because their marking period is, ends today at 4 o'clock. And so next week, everyone's going to get these great surprises. By the close on Thursday, stocks were higher again. The Dow up 270 points or eight tenths, the S&P up 20 points, a half a percent, the Russell gained 23 points or 1.2 percent, while the transports added 107 or seven tenths. So where did we see the weakness? We didn't. But if you ask what happened to NASDAQ, well, it ended flat, it wasn't up, it wasn't down, which means that there, were, there was an exact match between buyers and sellers going into the quarter end, right? Because the index didn't really move. 
The sellers of tech clearly, the sellers yesterday of tech, clearly reallocating that money into the broader market. Note the, the action in the S&P was up. Note the action in the Dow Industrials, up. Note the action in the SMIDs, right? The small and mid cap, the Russell, they were up. So money's moving in there. While the current buyers of tech, they're expecting another quarter of our performance, which is where I disagree. It's up 30% plus already. My gut tells me that the second half of the year is going to see more action in the other sectors, which is why I keep saying that any new money I'm adding to the portfolio is not in tech. It's in industrials, financials, healthcare, aerospace and defense, consumer staples, value names. And that uh, will also end up rebalancing the portfolio as you build a bigger position in the non-tech names than the percentage of, of tech ends up going down. You see how that works? So I am rebalancing. Now, I'm not saying I don't like tech. What I'm saying is I have enough exposure. So if, I, if it continues to outperform, guess what? I'm going to go along for the ride. I'm not left behind. But if those other sectors begin to raise their head like I think they're going to do, I'm in bed with them too. It's called the diversified portfolio. And just in case tech comes under some pressure in the months ahead, I'm good with that too. Why? Because tech isn't going away. And any future weakness is going to give me an opportunity to buy more. But it also depends on the names you own. This isn't a passive market. Just don't buy everything. It's a stock picker's market. Know what you own and why you own it. For me, I'm in the big mega caps. Partly reflects who I am. Okay, now, you also heard of all the U.S. banks. They passed the first phase of the stress test uh, the other day. And that's good, right? It's good for the financials. The banks, they were all higher yesterday. The XLF up 1.7%, leaving it only down 2% on the year. The sector favorites, J.P. Morgan up 3%, Bank of America up 2%, Wells Fargo up 4.5%. The KRE, which is super regionals, ended up 2%, leaving that group only down 28% year to date. Think SVB. And while many of those of the regionals remain down double digits on the year, there are some investors that are finding opportunity. But buyer beware. There are still some concerns swirling around them. Think commercial real estate loans. So the regionals are not for everyone. In any event, watch as the big boys now make all kinds of stock buyback uh, announcements and divvy increase announcements uh, post the stress test, right? And that should start today, and that should continue to help them advance, at least in the short term. Early indications are showing them all quoted higher in the pre-market. Treasury sold off uh, uh, on the central bank news, right? As you would expect, prices plunge, sending yields up, right? That's always the case, is that inverse relationship. The two-year shot higher, ending the day up 15 basis points to yield 4.86%. And this morning, it's up again, yielding 4.9. While the 10-year rose 14 basis points to yield 3.85, the three-month is now yielding 5.35%. The six-month is yielding 5.5%. All this does is reflect the fact that we're going to see at least two more rate hikes, and that will prove to be headwinds for stocks, but more specifically, the tech stocks which is just a warning flag. It's not a panic flag. It's just a warning flag. And as expected, the dollar did what? Yep. It surged up 44 cents to end the day at 103.35, which now has taken the dollar up and through trend line resistance at 103.04, leaving it now to test the May high at 104.32. And why did it surge? Hello, higher rates, and higher rates are going to create more demand for the dollar by institutional investors, and a higher dollar will put pressure on the commodity complex, think gold. And in fact, gold got smacked, right? Testing the long-term 200-day moving average trend line at 1897. As I said, it was going to probably do, and I expected it to happen, but I expected to hold that, that, uh, that level. But if the dollar surges up and through the May high, then all bets are off. That's where we could see the gold trade down to the March lows of 1855. Now, I'm watching this closely because it might be time to start dipping my toes into gold again. Now, oil, while also a commodity, it did buck the trend. It rose 22 cents to end the day at 69.78. And this morning, it's up again at 69.90, right? Remember, the Saudis are set to cut production by a million barrels per day starting July 1st, which is tomorrow, as they try to manage supply. Additionally, the strong U.S. macro data yesterday helped to, find, helped to give it some support. Look, oil is lower on the year. It's down 13% year to date, as so many expected that recession, right? And they remain concerned about the broader global economy. The stronger dollar is not helping, 
but the majority of the move lower has been about the global economy and the role that China plays in it, which I think is way overdone. You know that because Chinese demand remains strong no matter what they say. Analysts use the Chinese weak and then strong and then weak and strong argument daily. One day it's weak. The very next day it's strong. It's ridiculous. In any event, oil remains in the 6572 range. And let me remind you, the Saudis are not happy about that. So I fully expect we're going to hear more from OPEC Plus and the Saudis. U.S. futures this morning are up as the sun rises over the Atlantic. The Dow up 100 points. The S&P is up 18. The Nasdaq up 80. The Russell is up 12. Right? It's all about the eco data today, and specifically the PCE, the Fed's favorite inflation gauge. And that is expected to decline on the top line, only up one, uh, one tenth of a percent month over month, and up 3.8% year over year. But the focus is going to be on the core rate, because that is expected to remain sticky. Core month over month expected to be up three tenths, while the core year over year is expected to be plus 4.7%, which is the same as last month. There will be no decline, and therein lies the issue. In addition, we're going to get personal income, personal spending of, uh, up three tenths and up two tenths of a percent, as well as the University of Michigan sentiment survey at 63.9. One year inflation expectations of 3.3%, while the University of Michigan five to 10 year inflation expectation remains anchored at 3%. Neither of those are anywhere close to the 2% target that JJ is targeting. So just saying. The next hurdle for the markets is going to be the start of earnings season. And that officially begins on July 14th. So just in two weeks. European markets this morning are higher as well. All up more than 1% across the board. For the year, Italy has been the outperformer up 20% year to date. The UK has been the huge underperformer only up 1% year to date. France, Germany, Spain, and Eurostock indexes are all up about 16%, give or take a percent or two, right? The Eurozone top line inflation data came out today, came in at 5.5%, which is down. Yet core, core inflation data rose to 5.4. And again, that's the issue and that will keep the ECB on course. The S&P ended the day at 43.96, up 20 points. This morning, it appears as if there's going to be more excitement. Futures are up again, and Apple is trading at 190.99 in the pre-market, blasting up and through 190.73, which is the price it needed to become what? A $3 trillion company, right? So expect all that excitement to add to the tech excitement. The S&P appears to want to now test the June high of 44.50, which would be a 1.2% move from here. Something that could easily happen, especially since Apple will surely cause tech investors to want to pile in. In any event, it is what it is. And a well-diversified portfolio will carry you through to the end goal. We could see more exaggerated moves today as so many hit the road yesterday, right? Asset managers, portfolio managers, traders, they hit the road yesterday and last night. Remember, stick to your plan. Do not make emotional decisions. Give me a buzz. I'm happy to talk to you about it, right? Because uh, I learned the hard way long ago not to make emotional decisions. In any event, uh, take good care, and I will, uh, I will uh, get on to what's for dinner. So this is Tuscan pasta salad. It's a great side dish to any family barbecue. It's easy to make, and it works well at any cookout. It's colorful, it's festive, and it's delicious. But best of all, it's mean to be eaten cold, right? So compliments, uh, you can make it ahead of time, put it in the fridge, pull it out when you're ready. It's, it's great on the 4th of July barbecue. So for this, you need a pound of farfalle pasta. That's like the baby bow tie. You need uh, Genoa salami sliced into strips. You need a can of chichi beans rinsed and drained. You need two and a half cups of grape tomatoes sliced in half. You need, uh, you know, black olives. You need two and a half cups of rough chopped spinach. A half of, uh, you need a, a sliced red onion. You need two cups of diced provolone, not sliced, right? Buy the block of provolone and then just cut it into small pieces. Uh, and you need a jar of sun-dried tomatoes in the oil. Now for the dressing, you know, you need uh, one and a half cups of mayo, a quarter cup of white wine vinegar, a quarter, uh, uh, three quarters of a cup of water, a one teaspoon each of Dijon mustard, sugar, kosher salt, black pepper, and dried oregano. You're going to bring a, salt, a pot of salted water to a rolling boil and add the pasta. Let that cook for eight minutes. You want it to be al dente. Don't overcook it. It'll be like mush. 
then make the dressing. Combine all those ingredients and then using a whisk, mix it well. Actually, add a little bit less water. Start with a quarter cup of water and then if it gets too thick, just add a little bit more, right? Uh, until it's just nice the way you want it. While this is all happening, prepare everything else. Get all those ingredients, combine them into a large aluminum deep pan. When the pasta is done, drain it. You always save a mug full of water. Put the pasta back in the pot. Just add a little bit of water just to re-moisten it. Don't let it puddle, uh, uh, stir it up just so it's kind of coated. Then take the pasta and dump it into that big aluminum pan with all the other ingredients. Then toss it and mix it well so it's all mixed together. Now take the dressing that you made, put the dressing on top, air to less is more. Remember, you can always add more. If you add too much, then you, then you can't take it away. Add dressing, toss it, taste it, adjust if necessary. If you need salt and pepper or whatever, just adjust that to your taste as necessary. Uh, and then cover it, put it in the fridge, right? Now, you can, listen, if you want to, can you eat it warm like that right when you're done? Yeah, you can, but it's not meant to be eaten that way. So cover it, put it in the fridge, uh, let it cool down, right? If you make this the day before, it's fine. Put it in the fridge. The next day when you're ready to use it, take it out. Let it sit on the counter for an hour or so before you're ready to eat it. Toss it so that it kind of warms up the room temperature. It'll still be cold. It's not going to be a hot pasta plate. It'll still be a little bit cool, but that's what it's supposed to be. In any event, it will complement anything you have. Cheeseburgers, hot dogs, steak, chicken, uh, pork chops, well, lobster, anything you have. Uh, this dish will complement it. And actually, it's a great dish to have, you know, during the summer at either family outings or other barbecues, or even if you go to one, you make it, you bring it with you uh, as something to put on their table. In any event, look, it's Friday, it's June 30th, the, uh, uh, the, the July 4th weekend is just around the corner. I won't be here on Monday, but I'll be back to you on Wednesday of next week, uh, coming to you live from Cape Cod. In any event, have a great weekend. Until I see you again, Take good care.